Money is the currency of transactions. Trust is the currency of interactions. So behind this clever one-liner lies an important truth about the importance of trust in all aspects of our social lives. Whether it's with our partner or kids, our neighbor or the local retailer, or a new employer. Whether we're negotiating a pay raise with our boss or asking a colleague for feedback, trust is at the core of every interaction we have. Trust can be a, an emotional experience too. So I'd like you to think back about a time when somebody you thought you knew well betrayed your trust. Or a time where you entered into a new relationship uh, with somebody you hadn't met before and you need to trust them with something very important. How did that make you feel? What words come to mind? Were you, as this slide says, maybe fearful, anxious? Um, were you upset, maybe, angry at the betrayal? Well, whatever emotion came to your mind, I, I bet it was something profoundly unpleasant. Um, on top of this, trust can be very fragile. It often takes a long time to build, and it can be irreparably destroyed in an instant. And this is why we have a saying in the Netherlands, trust comes on foot and leaves on a horseback. So trust and the social interactions we have are intrinsically related. On the one hand, uh, the interactions we have with others provide us with rich diagnostic information about their trustworthiness. And this information narrows the uncertainty that we have about how others will behave and act towards us. And this allows us to take this leap of faith towards trusting someone. Um, at the same time, trust enables us to engage in productive interactions and work together as if this uncertainty about others' behavior uh, didn't exist. Furthermore, repeated interactions over time allow for the accumulation of evidence of trustworthiness, which then strengthens our trust and allows us to essentially take trust for granted. This also explains, maybe, why we have such strong emotional responses to trust when it is violated. Because it reminds us that this uncertainty about others' behavior is real and that we were actually wrong to trust that person and to take trust for granted. Now, with everything that can go sideways in the dynamics of trust, we, on top of this, uh, have seen, um, and as has been talked about in other talks, uh, these global trends over the past decade. And these have complicated the puzzle of trust. These trends have profoundly changed the nature of our interactions in long-lasting ways. For instance, we've all experienced um, or most of us, a transition into hybrid work where we partially work from home and partially in the office. We increasingly are working with colleagues across geographical, cultural, and temporal boundaries. Our work is increasingly project-based where we temporarily team up with colleagues on a specific task and then disband again once that task is completed. And then in addition, other trends like the rise of AI and blockchain technologies have further fundamentally changed the way we do business. And these trends, although they had been ongoing for several years now, have been further accelerated by the recent pandemic. This led, has led us to, uh, has led the interactions that we have to be more technology mediated, to be more fleeting, to be to be involved with more people that we're relatively unfamiliar with, and even more interaction with non-human entities like AI agents. So if the nature of our interactions has changed so profoundly, 
how will this impact trust? Can we build and maintain trust? Um, or is trust at risk because of everything that has been going on in the world? Well, so there seems to be quite a dominant sentiment um, among scientists and the general public uh, of a quite a pessimistic view of this, um, that, it is, that trust has become more difficult. And so as one example, um, the annual Edelman Trust Barometer uh, from last year that includes thousands of respondents and across dozens of countries across the globe has um, reported several conclusions and some of which you see here, which include distrust is society's default emotion. News sources fail to fix their trust problem. And many more. So this paints a pretty grim picture, right, of the state of trust in the world. And this is actually isn't limited to government or media, but it involves businesses too. It seems that Almost every other week now, we read in the news about some corporate scandal uh, that represents a major breach in trust. Whether it's the Volkswagen uh, emission scandal, or the Facebook data security scandal, or more recently, the PricewaterhouseCoopers tax scandal, the list goes on and on. Now, the purpose of my talk is to actually challenge that pessimistic view a bit um, and give you a more optimistic view. And while I may not be in a position to speak to issues of trust in government and media, I am in a position as, a, as an academic and researcher of this topic over the past decades to give you some insights on how we can build and maintain trust within the workplace. Um, and I think we can be optimistic for three reasons. One, uh, that same Edelman um, research report showed that uh, compared to previous years, trust in businesses, coworkers, and CEOs has actually gone up. And this is largely due, uh, they speculate, um, because of how businesses have, have responded to the pandemic. Second, these global trends that we talk, we're talking about today also represent unique opportunities for us to interact and connect with uh, our colleagues in ways that was previously not possible. For instance, while working from home and being on a Zoom meeting, uh, this gives us an opportunity to reveal more about our personal and family life, just like this dog picture here. And this allows us to get to know each other uh, on a more personal level. And this helps to boost what we uh, typically refer to as disclosure-based trust. In addition, as a supervisor, by allowing your followers to work from home and trusting them to do a good job, um, this can be a very effective way to boost what we call reliance-based trust. So we know from research that one of the most important determinants of whether you trust someone is whether they behave in a trustworthy manner. And in the scientific literature, we typically make a dis threefold distinction between aspects of uh, trustworthiness called ability, benevolence, and integrity. Now with today's technologies, um, these technologies actually facilitate demonstrating each of these aspects of trustworthiness uh, in ways that, that we previously couldn't. For instance, with these platforms like LinkedIn, uh, it has never been easier to comprehensively communicate your skills and abilities and competences, uh, both internally to the organization and externally. So this is a way to demonstrate ability. Second, with technologies like WhatsApp or Slack, um, it is very easy to just flick a colleague a message to check in on them and ask them how they're going. And uh, this is, you know, obviously a clear demonstration that you care about them and about their well-being. So that's a demonstration of benevolence. And finally, through the codification of our interactions, 
via uh, emails, uh, meeting minutes, and Zoom recordings, we can build a digital track record of our ability to deliver on our promises at work. And this helps to boost perceptions of integrity. So I mentioned two reasons so far. One is the level of trust um, that, that has actually increased. The second is we can have more meaningful interactions with each other. But there's actually a third reason why I think we can be optimistic. And this is a reason that uh, this is something that scientists have actually known about for decades, but we have kind of forgotten about. Uh, but because everything that has been happening in the world, uh, we're rediscovering it. And this is this notion that next to interaction-based approaches to building and maintaining trust, we can also rely on heuristic-based approaches, which don't require um, a long, rich history of interactions. So heuristics are essentially mental shortcuts that we use, we tend to rely on, to, um, to deal with complex decisions, such as whether we can trust others, um, and to allow us to arrive at fairly accurate conclusions uh, while avoiding cognitive overload. And we do this for trust as well. We rely on professional credentials and role expectations to reassure us of other people's competence and of the range of behaviors we can expect of them. We rely on demographic and personal similarities that we share with others to make predictions about how they will behave in ways that are similar to us and therefore more predictable. We rely on third parties' trust in others um, as a proxy for forming our own perceptions of trust. And fourthly, we rely on our general propensity to trust strangers when we're entering a new relationship and gouging somebody's trustworthiness. So I think these heuristic-based approaches are, um, are, are good news, uh, and, and they are uh, good news in, in four ways. Um, first, as I mentioned, these heuristic-based approaches don't rely on direct interactions, which also means it helps to avoid some of the challenges and, and complications that can sometimes um, occur when we, for instance, communicate using technology. Second, because heuristics are shortcuts, uh, it allows us to develop trust really quickly, um, something we, we tend to refer to as swift trust. Third, because many of these heuristic-based uh, sources are relatively stable factors, it allows us to maintain trust over extended periods of time. And fourth, many of these heuristics, uh, these factors, are actually under our direct control, uh, both as managers and as employees, meaning they are actionable. We can take concrete steps towards helping to maintain and nourish trust in the workplace. So, in conclusion, has the world and the nature of our interactions changed? Definitely. Um, should we uh, despair about the inevitable demise of trust um, among colleagues and in our workplace? I don't think so. Um, instead, I think we, can, we need to actively seek out newer and creative ways to have meaningful interactions with each other at work. In addition, I think we need to complement these interaction-based approaches with forgotten but recently rediscovered heuristic-based approaches that don't rely on direct interactions. And third, I think we can actually all do this. This is achievable as we can take quite concrete steps, even small steps, to help nourish trust in the workplace. Thank you very much.